And they ran a story by somebody named Chauncey DeVega. Quote, I find black garbage pail kids, black conservatives, fascinating. That's just unbelievable. You know, it's- he goes by the name of Chauncey DeVega. You know, I've been called Uncle Tom, Oreo, Oreo sellout, shameless. But this is a new one. Well, let's talk now to Chauncey DeVega. As my man Chauncey DeVega of the blog We Are Respectable Negroes says, I have author and blogger Chauncey DeVega here with us. Hello, I am Chauncey DeVega, and you are listening to the eponymously named Chauncey DeVega Show. You may recognize my voice from Ring of Fire Radio with Mac Papantonio, Tom Hartman, The Ed Shell, or the BBC. Sort of in a holding pattern, and we're waiting for the verdict from the grand jury, which will inevitably be based on all the leaks, the governor's declaration that he doesn't want a Negro uprising, which is in essence what he said. I don't think Nat Turner is running around, or Denmark Vesey. Uh, the police in Ferguson are armed to the teeth, and they're acting as though they're trying to bait the folk of Ferguson to rise up and to resist them when the no-bill verdict is inevitably released, letting Darren Wilson walk the streets a free man and return to his job. Talk about a thumb in the eye of the good people who have stood up against racist and brutal police authority and classist police authority in Ferguson, Missouri. Part one of the conversation here on the Chauncey Vegas show about Ferguson featured Mr. Lou Bois, Washington Spectator. He gave a wonderful perspective as a journalist who does the good foundational reporting of who, what, when, and why, and I guess how would also be included in that formulation in terms of thinking about how you're supposed to approach a story on the ground as a journalist. He came from the outside right at the end of the uprisings, and notice in my writings on ChaunceyVega.com, Alternate Salon, Chauncey Vega Show, I don't call what happened in Ferguson after the murder, and I do suggest, and it's my opinion, that the killing of Michael Brown by Darren Wilson, as it was aided and abetted as well by the police in an obvious and naked cover-up, was a murder. He was killed, and he was killed execution style. That I don't call that a riot. The riot that occurred in Ferguson, that was a riot of the police against the people of Ferguson and violating of their, and violating their civil rights as American citizens. And History always echoes. I, I keep thinking about that Howard Zinn quote, that history is a moving train. Conversation with Brother Paul Bryan's Freedom Rider, who we talked to in season two of the podcast. We are all children and daughters of history. We're heirs to history. And that the grave of Dred Scott, several miles away from where Michael Brown was killed. Think about it. The Supreme Court famously said, a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. Is there no better summation of Michael Brown's body laying in the street in Ferguson? And in testimony, I think, to what we're trying to do here on the Chauncey Vega Show and the types of conversations we try to have and will be having with the many guests who have agreed to appear on season three, that the mainstream media needs to be pushed. And sometimes a little truth sneaks out between the cracks, that light coming out from under the door. So Ludo Boyce had a great series of articles at the Washington Spectator. He detailed his experiences here on the podcast with class and race in Ferguson. Had a wonderful conversation, and lo and behold, CNN this week, actually today, it should still be up. This is Tuesday the 18th. It was the feature today that Soledad O'Brien and others went down to Ferguson, and they explored the area, and they've highlighted similar themes. And their narrative was around the one street right near where Michael Brown was killed that divides, quote-unquote, white Ferguson from black Ferguson. So the truth is revealed. So Lou Du Bois showed his light on the truth in Ferguson around race and class. And now CNN is shining their even brighter light on the same dynamics of race and class. So it's nice to be part of the chorus. But again, always share, tweet, tell your friends. You know, we've got the podcast of Chauncey DeVega show. CNN was talking about this, but Lou Bois and Chauncey DeVega were talking about it several days, if not a week ago, because that conversation was recorded about three weeks ago. So sitting here waiting for the no bill, and the best metaphor I can come up with is this is like an abscess tooth you get that pressure in your mouth, that tooth is infected, and it feels like something about to pop, and you're faced with this decision to do it yourself, or if you're lucky and got insurance and it's not a Saturday, you can get to the dentist and get it lanced and drained and get some antibiotics. And that's what that pressure feels like. I really do feel like, and I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way, that you're waiting for the other shoe to drop about Ferguson. It's a holding pattern, like a plane circling, like I wrote about in ChaunceyVega.com, and you just don't know what's going to happen. So... Using that analogy and that metaphor, the dilemma then becomes when those of us with righteous anger, righteous rage, who are upset about a perennial state of police thuggery and custodial citizenship, when those young folk who have been very skillful in keeping the media 
and staying in the center of the frame in many ways, be it showing up at the symphony orchestra, be it showing up at sporting events in St. Louis, Ferguson area, be it on Twitter, they are going to inevitably respond in the police based on Governor Nixon and other announcements and pronouncements. You know, the KKK is even saying they're going to show up there. I guess they're going to go Negro hunting, as is their habit or was their habit. And to the credit of Anonymous, they actually outed some of these KKK types, showed them what out their hoods, there are going to be some consequences, maybe people lose their job. Maybe it'll just be public shaming. The question then becomes, what do you do after? Does this represent a realignment of intergenerational youth politics against the old guard of the civil rights movement? Will this be a national movement? Is it just that temporary lancing of that poison-filled abscess, that boil, that poison comes out, but you still got the infection underneath? I just don't know. But my hope is that, when I was talking to my mom about this, about the riots in the 60s, that does this actually create long-term change? Yeah, it's a, it gets attention on the problem. Back in the day, you'd get a little federal money, perhaps, but you're rioting in your own communities, you're uprising in your own communities. The police are rioting, emphasizing that, against you in your own community. What comes next? So I had the great opportunity to talk to Pastor Renita Marie Lampkin. Wonderful, wonderful conversation. She is on the ground. You have seen her on the BBC on their website, also on their news. I believe Al Jazeera talked to her. I think she also had a clip on MSNBC. She is a frontline activist. She wrote a great series of pieces on the Huffington Post about white privilege in Ferguson as an activist, marching arm in arm with her black and brown brothers and sisters, and how even in that space, facing down police thugs, facing down sniper rifles, facing down tear gas, facing down flashbangs, that white privilege was still operative in that space, too, in some very surprising ways in terms of how folks thought cognitively about their own experiences, but also in terms of how folks frame the narrative about the events in Ferguson. Bernina Marie Lampkin is the pastor of the, quote, unquote, friendliest church in St. Charles. I like that. The St. John African Methodist Episcopal Church. So part one of the conversation of Ferguson was Luda Boyce. He said he gave us the setup. He gave us that punch. Boxers move. They have a jab. They have a cross. They go to the body. Pastor Lampkin gave the uppercut and the body blow. So she does a lot of great sharing here. We, this is, as I said, an amazingly timely conversation. We usually release the podcast on a Thursday. But given what's going down in Ferguson as we speak, if events transpire, I will post the podcast at John C. Vega Show on JohnCVega.com and also YouTube earlier. So it'll drop on late Tuesday, depending on what happens, or perhaps early Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. So again, this is a great conversation with Pastor Lampkin. I want to thank her for taking the time to talk about her activism in Ferguson, her experiences on the ground, what it was like to be shot with rubber bullets, in her case, a wooden bullet that actually injured her quite severely. So that picture of her, I'm sure, went viral on Twitter and elsewhere. And how she thinks about faith and how it motivates her activism and how she tries to integrate liberation theology and an understanding of Jesus Christ as both a historical figure and from her point of view as a figure in her faith, as one who stands with the powerless, not with the powerful. And that's such an important concept when we live in an era of prosperity gospel, the white right, and how folks are taking a Christian narrative that should be about defending the poor, the powerless, the weak, and the vulnerable, and they twist it to this narrative that hates on the poor, that hates on the vulnerable, that legitimates police thuggery, it legitimates and excuse makes for police violence. So Renita does some great sharing here, and I'm just so appreciative of her taking the time to talk. I do think you'll enjoy the conversation as well. Hello, Renita. On behalf of the listeners and fans of the podcast series here on We Are Respectable Negroes and ChaunceyDeVega.com, I just want to thank you for taking your time to sit down and chat with us about your experiences in Ferguson. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. So we've got a lot of media coverage of Ferguson. We'll talk about the 24-7 news cycle and how they have since moved on. And the old expression is, if it bleeds, it leads. But so much important work is still going on in Ferguson right now around the issues of police brutality, around the militarized police, around racial injustice and class injustice. And I discovered your work in the Huffington Post and then started reading more about your experiences in the Ferguson area. And I just felt compelled to reach out and trying to just give a portrait and paint a picture for folks who weren't there, so many of our realities are mediated. We can't all be where we would like to be. I know, for example, I was telling Mr. Lou Bois of the Washington Spectator earlier today that I really wanted to go down to Ferguson. I felt compelled. I felt it was necessary. But my mother made a appeal to me. She said, you are my only child. And if something were to happen to you, I did not know how I would live with myself. So I had to take a pass. But I figured my way of trying to do good work on this would actually be to reach out to folks who were there. So as someone who marched, who protested, who stood down, as I have described them, thuggish police who were really acting as the worst face of police authority in the racial state in Ferguson. What was it like? I know that's a broad question, but what were the sounds and the smells and what did you experience there? 
Well, um, there was a part of it that just seemed unreal. You know, there's things that maybe you see on TV, but to see it in real life, it just seemed like some movie. It wasn't until the police came out with the tanks and the riot gear and the barking dog standing with their shields and helmets and nameless jackets. That's when the people started really getting angry and the chants of F the police and, you know, other other chants. That's when all of that starts is when they come out and stand again. There's a part of it that's terrifying because you don't know how the police are going to respond and you know what they're capable of doing. There were nights when we had to run from them and it felt literally like we were running for our lives down in the sewers while they were shooting whatever it was they were shooting rubber bullets tossing gas cans out the out of the the vehicle loud sounds you couldn't hardly breathe the air is suffocating tear gas stinging eyes people vomiting people passing out, screaming, running in a frantic panic. It just seemed like something out of a movie about some other place. It just didn't seem like this was our neighborhood. It was absolutely insane. Wow. So I know you were actually injured with a wooden bullet. People were shot with rubber bullets, stun grenades, tear gas. But when you're in this melee was like you said, it was almost surreal. Did you feel like these are your police turning against you, or was it just an affirmation, especially for the young black and brown folks there, that the police they aren't protecting us, they're policing us? What were those moments like? Was it just a moment of clarity to be like, man, these police really aren't on our side, or was it just a moment of cognitive dissonance where you just couldn't believe it? Um, it definitely just couldn't believe it, and it is definitely affirmation that the role of the police is to protect property and the owners of property, the interest of property owners. They, they are not to protect and serve the common everyday person. And that has been proved over and over and over again. And even by the mere fact that they are willing to tear up a an area like West Florissant, where it's a moderate income, moderate to low income, the same type of action has not been taken against the protesters in more affluent areas where the protesters have been protesting. Probably the closest thing to that type of action that we have seen was just last week over in the South City area in a business district where protesters were protesting and the police um, circled around us, blocked us off where we could, there was no place to go. And then they pepper sprayed us. Mm. But there was no flying tear gas. There was no shooting bullets. It was the very close, the encircling. And to watch them pepper spray those children in their face. Oh my gosh. And one of our little girls fell to the ground and she's screaming and Darius bent down to pick her up and the police came over and just started whacking the hell out of him with his billy club. It's such a helpless feeling. You know, I want to go over and stop it. But at the same time, I've got these other kids that also want to go over and stop it. And so if, if they get there, then it's going to be a bigger riot. So trying to keep those kids moving versus rescuing Darius, I mean, it was just such a, it was heart-wrenching. And it's something that should not be experienced on our street. So you're there in your capacity as an activist, as a leader in the religious community, as a spokesperson in the broader Ferguson, St. Louis County community. And what were the police actually charging you with? I mean, what was their logic in terms of assaulting you guys like this? Because you're exercising your constitutional rights. So when they're waving the billy club, when they're donning their masks, when they're hiding their badges... What are they seeing you as? What's going through their minds? I mean, were they saying things to you? Were they saying move because you're breaking this law? Or were they just these almost mindless automatons of violence? Well, the cover story is that we're not allowed in the streets and people can peacefully protest on the sidewalks all day and all night. But you cannot be in the street. So the angst with that is that if we confine our protest to where we are told to protest, and when they say it's time to be quiet, we're quiet, that they, in Ferguson, they said there's a noise ordinance, and so we can't be, we can't be above a normal talking 
range after 11 p.m. And then they arrested the kids for saying the F word, saying that that was language that incited violence. So it's everything from obstructing traffic to breaking noise to saying bad words, um, they, anything, anything they can find. And they actually lied. They said on many occasions, on several occasions, they said that rocks were thrown at them when rocks were not thrown at them. They said that bottles were thrown at them when bottles were not thrown at them. And even to say that Molotov cocktails were thrown at them when Molotov cocktails were not thrown at them. And But whatever they say, the general public believes, and then that gives them the sympathy for inciting violence against us. So in terms of actually being at the event and going home and watching how the event is covered by the media, I've had some experiences like that where I was at protest events or political events, and you come home and you turn on the TV and you're like, well, that's not exactly what happened. How do you feel that, number one, the local media, especially the local media that is predominantly watched by the white folk of Ferguson, and also the national media, in particular the Fox News right-wing media, how are they distorting reality and actually creating a sense of disinformation about the events in Ferguson? Well, one thing they're doing is they find people who are very impassioned and they catch them in those very passionate moments and record these bursts of information, these bursts, these outbursts even. Um, and that's all they show. Or they wait until the police turn on us and then they record that. And so they don't record what sets off the anger. They just record the anger to justify the action. Um, it has actually caused the mainstream media to be run off the streets. The young people have actually, um, three times that I'm aware of, ran mainstream media off the streets. And because I remember seeing MSNBC folk who actually had rocks and bottles thrown at them. And then the young folks there went and confronted them and basically said what you said, that they're angry and that you guys are not telling the truth. Right. That's right. So you're getting this distorted framing. And as I said, this is, you know, I so appreciate you sitting down and, and chatting with us here for the podcast. Because, again, this is all mediated realities. I'm in Chicago. All I can do is talk to folks. You can read online. You can follow Twitter. You can try to reach out to people who are there. And I always try to try to be reasonable, right? You know, there's two or three or four sides to every story. But I also have to ask, because you were there and you're a member of that community, what is your take around sort of the color line and the class line in Ferguson? Because the way that a lot of our white brothers and sisters, the ones who are wearing these Darren Wilson T-shirts, go into the baseball games, who are online, many of them probably are not there, but, you know, there's a public opinion poll that showed that the majority, and this is a small sample, of white folks in the St. Louis County, Ferguson area, number one, support Darren Wilson, and number two, think we're talking about race too much. So is it just that they're living in their own bubble of white racial innocence and willful denial? Is, are the racial dynamics just obvious there in Ferguson for anyone who cares to see them? And these are folks who are just hostile and resentful. What's your take on it there? Well... My take on it is really not much different than most of the rest of the country. White folks live in this glaze where everything is fine. And they because they don't consider themselves racist, they don't see things through racist eyes. So for for most white folks, I would say that things are just normal. When you try to ask why well how do you account for the disparities in the number of African Americans that are arrested versus the number of white folks arrested or the, you know, the black faces in the courtroom versus the white faces in the courtroom or the educational statistics, all of that. And they are very quick and very easy to put it back onto the individual. Well, if they weren't breaking the law, they wouldn't have gotten a ticket. So they had to have done something. And I, I, a very, a very eye-opening and just telltelling example is I have a good friend, um, well, friend anyway, but but he holds me in very high regard. And he stumbled across just two weeks ago the information about me being shot and being on the red on the front line, and he found it unbelievable. He said. He said, my wife and I sit and talk about this every time it comes on the news. He said, and, and I just keep saying they have to be doing something. The police wouldn't just fire on them for doing nothing. <laughs> the police wouldn't just arrest them for doing nothing. He said, and then 
I'm trying to find your phone number and I Google you and this comes up. And now the Reverend Renita has been shot by these police. What would you have done to cause this? He said, it changed the whole image for me. And this is a person who is very liberal, considers himself very liberal. He's a Jewish man. He fought, he was part of the civil rights movement in the 60s. He benefited from, from laws and that were changed on his behalf and on behalf of the community. And yet he was so disconnected that he could not believe that the media would be lying until he saw me as a part of the story. And the white racial frame, to, to borrow from Brother Joe Fegan, noted sociologist, is one hell of a drug because one would think that folks could look and say, you know what, these young black and brown folk, they must have some sort of grievance. These black and brown are not crazy to have the same stories told over and over again about police brutality, all the empirical data. This is not some unknown unknown. Right. We have tons of data about racism and classism in the criminal quote unquote, justice system, housing segregation, the labor market. So in terms of that interaction, where you have somebody in your circle of friends, a friend of yours, someone who sees you as a full human being, what's limiting him and others from saying, whoa, there must be something going on where my fellow citizens are so upset, are treated so badly. Is it just, you know, white privilege 101 and this cultivated ignorance? Or is it just a deep belief that the state must be neutral and on my side, and I can't imagine that somehow it treats people differently? I, I like the term you use, cultivated ignorance. This particular person is a professor, and he has access to data. He's an intelligent man. He's um, well-traveled. He lives in a very diverse community, a community that prides itself on its diversity, and yet is ignorant. And in a sense, I, I, I actually call it willful ignorance. I think that when we, when, when white people can choose to be ignorant and we can say, well, I just didn't know, then that lets us off the hook for dealing with the realities. And even if all the, all, the only hook we're left off of is our own guilty hook, holding our own selves responsible, we are. But once it's in your face, you have to deal with it or decide you're not going to. And that's part of what's happening. It's this this pushback. People don't want to deal with the realities that they are that that they have to face. One of the best things in the movement that's happening right now, there's a group um, group of young activists. They call themselves Tribe X and they hmm. formed uh, out of this mess. And they are doing Occupy SLU, Occupy St. Louis University campus. And they have pitched tents and they are out there and they are marching on campus and they are doing teach-ins and sit-ins and St. Louis University students are coming out and being a part of it. And they chose the SLU campus because St. Louis University is a very upscale, private, Jesuit school, primarily white students from affluent homes. And... It is very much a place of privilege. I, I was out there with them last night and one of the students said, or night before last, one of the students said, I am a senior. I'm on my way out of here. But what you guys are doing out here, she said, I've never felt like this was my campus. I've never felt like I belonged here. I've never felt more like I belonged here than I do in this moment. And when, when white folks can just, seclude themselves whether it's in in the in behind the campus doors or behind the iron gates when when folks can just block it off then they they don't have to deal with it and then then they can just throw money at it and collect food for it and you know say nice little prayers for the cause but they don't have to really deal with the messiness and and what they're doing at occupy Pi slew is making people deal with it. When we marched in South City, we made people deal with it. When we marched in the more affluent area of Ferguson, we made people deal with it. At the Rams game, at the Cardinals game, at the Walmarts, they're making people deal with it. Um, you might be able to avoid driving down West Florissant or North Florissant, but you can't just 
stop going everywhere. And the kids are saying, we will be everywhere you are making you deal with it. I mean, that's so powerful, too. And I always like to give love and affirmation to our young black and brown and poor uh, citizens, our young brothers and sisters, because in the mass media, black youth and brown youth are horribly maligned. And how did they respond to you as a white sister going out and marching with them? And how did they maintain their sense of cohesion? Because there's a great phrase, Professor Lonnie Guineer, there's a book called The Miner's Canary. And she basically says, if you look at America as a democracy that is still very much one that is developing, that was you had a birth defect at its founding, the killing of First Nations brothers and sisters, chattel slavery, that we're still a work in progress. And it has been black Americans and brown Americans and poor folks who have forced this democracy to live up to its obligations. Mm-hmm. So how did those young black and brown folks who were out there really acting as full and responsible citizens, even though they've been treated as second and third class citizens, how did they respond to you and how did they maintain their sense of esprit de corps and self-esteem and unity in the face of all this police power and abuse? Well, they love me. And and at first, you know, my first night out there, some would say, whose side are you on? Mm-hmm. Um, I stick with, I'm on the Lord's side. I'm on the side of righteousness. I'm on the side of life. Um, fortunately, there were enough young people who knew my children. Um, and it seemed like it, in just a very key moment when my authenticity or legitimacy might come into question that someone would say, oh, that's Darren's mom or that's Chrissy's mom or, you know, I know someone who goes to her church or, you know, some, something like that. I didn't just show up on the street out of nowhere. I've been involved in the lives of young people for, I mean, my kids are that age, you know, so I've been where they are. And so for the young folks who knew me, they knew I wasn't just showing up and they could vouch for the fact that I've been engaged and involved in their lives. I've gone to their football games. I've gone to their plays. They've been in my house. They've I've fed them, transportation, whatever. So now, you know, are there some that are still kind of like, you know, whatever? Sure. Young people, that's just people. But I would say by and large, they know I love them. And young people, they don't care who loves them. They care about who's real with them. And you don't have to be black to love them. They, they let white people love them, too. And they receive it and they respect it and they honor it. I mean, that's the power of the love principle. For all of our jaded cynicism, I often tell my students and other folks, we're all the product of folks who were invested in us mm-hmm. and took a chance to love us, even when sometimes we weren't worthy of that love given our behavior. Yes. So you have that credibility. And I'm wondering, too. Again, you know, you're so introspective and certainly going to talk about your Huffington Post series about white privilege and your own experiences, because I'm very curious about how folks reacted to that moment of transparent honesty, talking about race and privilege, even while you're marching and being shot at how you could be so introspective. But thinking about what happened or in terms of your own personality, your upbringing or personal moment of critical self-reflection or, you know, spiritual calling why did you choose to go out there and be involved? And there are other folk who are religiously inclined who may actually be pastors or ministers in their own churches, and they may happen to be white or black, and not get involved and just stay home. Um, I would say that, that being in the streets and that type of ministry is very much my personality and has been my calling. Before I came to the church, the, the person who invited me into this organized church stuff, I was on the street with a bullhorn doing street ministry in my 20s. So it's not, this is not unfamiliar ground for me. All I can really say is that it's very much a compelling. For me, as a spiritual person, I see this as spiritual warfare. And the war is against our our young people. And the war is fought in, the, the battle is, the war was declared in the heavens, not God's heaven, but you know, in the heavens. And... Mm-hmm. And it plays out on earth. My role, what I all, all I see my role as is an intercessor to pray for our young people. And they allow me to speak to them. The only thing I'm really protesting is evil. I'm protesting Satan every night I'm out there. Protesting the destruction against our young folks. And protecting their right to fight for their own life. And as they are fighting and demanding in this natural realm, I'm fighting and demanding with them in the spiritual realm, determined that as best possible, not one more 
and not not any of those are going to be taken by this unjust system systemic ills and evils are so deep that people don't even recognize and realize that it's wrong and and you look at i know several really good police officers with great hearts and deep compassion and and broad spirits and deep faith and i went how can you function in an unjust system how can you do this every day how can you follow these orders how can you um but there's something about the system that the lies of the system have become truth and and when that happens it's bought into and people think they're defending a truth when really they're perpetuating a lie and when you talk to those police officers i have to ask what is their answer? How do they reconcile it? They just say things like, well, you know, Renita, and the law says, and, you know, this kind of stuff. They aren't really emotionally attached to it, which is really quite interesting because these are all African-American police officers that I know. I mean, and they're part of the system. And they're part of the system. They don't see a problem. They don't see the problem with the system. For one of my friends, I said, you realize that without your uniform, you're one of them. Mm. So, you know, before you get all haughty and beside yourself, you need to really look at yourself because those white guys that you're standing on the line with, if they didn't know who you were when you're driving your car down the street, you one of them. And so don't ever forget that because they ain't never going to forget it until the system changes. And so what those kids are doing on that side of the line is for your butt too. Yeah, it reminds me, you know, this is in major, many major uh, parts of this country, you know, major cities and I'm sure smaller municipalities, too. But I remember in New York City a few years ago, they had a series of exposés about black police officers who were undercover wearing the color of the day, which basically means that we're detectives don't shoot us. And several of them have been shot by white cops. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, they did they gave interviews off the record saying we're New York City cops and we're black and we know how rotten the system is. Because these white cops are shooting us, and we're showing them the color of the day. We're using the safe word. But in their eyes, they see us as black first and male and a a preeminent threat as opposed to a full human being who could perhaps be on their side. So black police officers are always vexing to me in that regard. But you said something really interesting and I think very, very powerful about the idea of evil. Right. One could be an agnostic or an atheist. One could be a secular humanist or they can be religious or spiritually inclined. But this idea of different types of forces and power and the idea of sort of existential power, because I was thinking about your, as I said, very powerful observation, thinking about the body of Michael Brown laying in the street. That was an act of racial terrorism and really the banality of evil, if I've ever seen it. Yes. And the way that people went to justify an excuse make for this. That is what really touched me. As I said, I've written extensively about, you know, the Ferguson incident, Trayvon. And I keep going back to the point that this is racial terrorism. And if you don't understand it as racial terrorism, you don't understand this as an act of civil evil. And when you point it out that way, I'm, again, amazed by the defensiveness sometimes by folks to not call something what it is. Right. They're not going to call it what it is if they can't admit it. If you can't admit something is what it is, you can't call it. And when we live in denial, that denial is a protection. It protects us from having to deal with the truth. And for some folks, there are some people who believe that the system is just so deeply entrenched in injustice that it will never change. And the best we can do is figure out how to live peacefully in it. And I, I, re- I reject that. Also, too, I mean, and you're spot on there, because on one hand, it's almost like a con game where you tell folks the system works, the system works, all you have to do is participate, where the system is by design work to legitimate the wills and desires of some folk at the expense of others. So for a lot of folk, the system is really broken and you need a third way and you need a way to articulate what's really going on. And on that point of thinking about other ways of reaching folks and transforming consciousness and speaking truth to power, can you tell us a little bit about your pieces in Huffington Post, especially your last piece on Ferguson and white privilege and how it was responded to? Um, well, it got it was met with a lot of hostility from white folks. I don't know if you read any of the comments or not. I, mean, I, I read a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> Everything from I'm a disgrace to my race to I'm just all kinds of things. There were some African Americans who did not appreciate the piece. Felt like it was like I was being self righteous 
and not and something about like and I can't exactly remember how this was worded but there was something about my ability to be able to speak about it and write about it and have a platform of it is in it of itself privilege and that's a privilege that I myself was not recognizing and not denying or some something like that so people have are all over the place with it but I would say by and large I've had much more positive feedback than negative and I didn't it was even more so evident this past weekend when there was the Ferguson October and there were people here from all all over the, the country. I was stopped many times on the street by all kinds of people, young, old, white, black, who read the piece and were very appreciative of the piece. Some people found it to be a type of courageousness that they, they themselves were not familiar with. Um, mm-hmm. I think when we speak in terms of ourselves and our own experiences, that, it, you know, it, it does create a vulnerability in a way that's uncomfortable. But for me, that's truth. And I I can really only speak of the truths that I know firsthand. For me, I understand all of this as God's story. And when we have enlightened moments and we have great experiences, when we've been through troubled times, when we have these ahas, I mean, that's to me is all God being revealed in the midst of circumstances. And when we don't tell God's story, that itself is a type of arrogance that's unacceptable. You have a fascinating journey in terms of becoming a pastor in a predominantly, if not majority, African-American church. Can you just sort of tell the story of that calling? Because I was reading your bio and I saw you on HuffPost and I read the bio. I was like, I'd have to talk to Pastor Renita because this is just really compelling. How did that journey come to be? Um, short answer is I was invited to the church. A woman was just kind of owned me and my children as her children and nurtured me. And as I started sharing with her my sense of vision and calling, I, I was like 24 at the time, she gave me the book of discipline and she told me to go home and read it. And I found within those pages a very concise paragraph of this very long, I had 14 pages of mission. And there it all was summed up in this one little paragraph. And so it was the sense of mission, the the calling of the church that I felt very much connected with. I'm just grateful that people allow me to be their pastor. We live out the mission of the church, the calling of God in our local church. It's, It's a great faith tradition to be connected with. And just in terms of the geography for the folks listening to the podcast, so your church is now, correct me now, is, is in St. Louis County? No, my church is in St. Charles. Okay, so you're in St. Charles, and how far away is that from Ferguson? And do you have folks in Ferguson who are involved either directly or indirectly with the protests and certainly, you know, the police brutality and, the, and what I call a police riot against the people of Ferguson? So are you giving pastoral care and ministry to folks who are actually involved in that community that's been hurt? So my church is about 10, maybe 15 minutes from Ferguson. Okay. And yeah, yeah, there is pastoral care going on every every time we gather. We have there have been discussions everything from life plans to the value of life itself. Not everyone out there is Christian. You know, there's lots of atheists, lots of Muslims, um, lots of people of various faiths, people who have faith traditions that I've never heard of before. I, they may have even made them up themselves as their own faith journey. Um, but there's something about God's love that connects us all, no matter what your path is. And so the greatest form of pastoral care that I give is to not judge their journey, um, but to love them with God's love and let them process it, provide the space for them to process what God's love means to them in those moments. I believe strongly the scripture says that everyone who seeks me will find me. And as people are seeking God, um, whatever journey it takes them on, that journey will lead them to God because I believe, I believe the word says that. And so I see my role is to not guide people to God, but to reveal God to people. And, um, And many, 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 um, I've I've been just so absolutely stunned by the number of people who have said things like, you make me want to go to church again. 
you make me have, um, you, you make me question that there might really be a God. I don't believe in your Jesus, but I believe, I believe your belief in your Jesus. That was a very powerful statement. Other, other statements along those lines. And, and that is very humbling for me. And I would say that, that in terms of, of life living, um, I think that would be the greatest thing that a person could say about another person's life is that they saw God through them. And I was thinking, too, about the role of churches and synagogues and mosques in terms of thinking about civil society, especially with the black freedom struggle and the role of the black church in terms of bringing people together, training folks for resistance, providing resources and so on. But I was thinking, too, as, as we sort of go down this road for a, a quick second, is the idea, and it's certainly not my observation, as some other folks have made it repeatedly, that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week in the United States. Now, I don't know if that's empirically true, but I suspect that it likely is in terms of thinking about how the racial hierarchy in a segregated society is reflected by people's religiosity and where they choose to worship and the churches and mosques and synagogues they attend. And again, thinking about poor brother Michael Brown and the events in Ferguson, one of the points I've tried to drive home, and I recently said this on Ring of Fire TV, was what you're seeing in Ferguson is a human rights issue. And my worry mm -hmm. is, number one, race certainly is predominant here. Class matters, too. But based on your particular experiences in Ferguson and also in the church, what do you think it would take for white, predominantly white congregations and white brothers and sisters more generally to say, whoa, Michael Brown and the violation of the civil rights of the people of Ferguson, that could be my kid. That could be my community. This isn't just about race. This is about human rights. What would it take for those conversations to happen in our, in our churches and our synagogues and elsewhere? Um, honestly, and this isn't going to yeah, sound please. very nice, but <laughs> tell the truth. We tell the truth. It's going to take their kids being the killed the same way. It would take their kids being killed the same way our kids are being killed. Because until, just like until my friend could see his friend being injured in that mess, until you can connect with it personally, you don't connect with it. And they will forever say that they'll believe the images, the demonization and the vilifying of these young boys. They show the worst pictures, the worst images when they're on TV, when the white kids die. They don't show when the white kids are killed. They don't show the pictures of them with their beer and high and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But that's what they do to our kids. And the white and white America says, well, they had it coming. Well, if they wouldn't have lived such hard lives. And it's going to take their kids being killed the way our kids are killed in order for them to really get it. Now, in terms of segregated Sundays, I don't see a problem with it. I think that people have the right to worship where it is comfortable and powerful for them to worship. I would much rather worship in a black church experience than in a white church experience. I've been in both. I know the difference. That's my preference. And I think people should have access to wherever they want to go in terms of segregation. I don't think people should be denied access because they're white or denied access because they're black. But to have a situation in a worship setting that fits your style and speaks to who you are as a human being, I'm all for it. It's necessary. It's necessary to live in this world as the human you are. And, and what... It re really pisses me off is when it's when when there's discussion and I've been in theological discussions about the segregated churches. The white folks are always saying, well, we you know, the black folks can come to our church and they look stunned when I say, well, you could go to theirs. You could come to our church. Why? Why do we have to give up our worship experience and, and come to yours? And they just look like, huh, I ain't really ever thought about that. It's insane. I mean, it gets me back to that old, you know, it's, you know, it's a classic example in terms of thinking about white privilege. And we can have this conversation about race, about uh, class privilege, heteronormativity, et cetera. But especially with racial privilege, the analogy about the cafeteria, and there was a book written in the early 90s with this as a subtitle. It was like, why are all the black kids sitting together in the yes. cafeteria? Mm -hmm. As opposed to being reflective and saying, well, why are all the white kids sitting together? Right. And, and that's a very powerful example of day-to-day -day white privilege. But seeing that you're on the ground there in Ferguson, and I asked uh, Mr. Du Bois this earlier. What do you think will happen since you have your ear to the ground? You're out there with the folks. You're still marching, still participating, talking to, talking to people. 
what do you think will happen? And you can feel free to agree or disagree with my prediction here. I don't think it's a I go to Vegas and I put odds on this bet. When Darren Wilson is not indicted by that grand jury and he walks, what do you think will happen? Ooh, I am. I, I don't know. I, I, there is going to be some amount of uproar. What that uproar is going to look like, how it is going to play out, where it is going to play out, the depth and breadth of it is yet to be known. But there will be an uproar, and I believe that it won't just be in the St. Louis area. Hmm. I think that the nation is tired. And this is representative. And I and I expect that he will not be indicted. And I expect that because the way the laws and the system is set, are set up, they are set up to favor the actions of police officers with very little questioning and very little accountability. And if we really want to achieve justice and stop the, the, the unjust murder of our children, we have to change those policies. We have to we have to create a system where police officers are held with higher accountability. That's the only way this is going to be curved. And I mean, I always love to play the counterfactual and others have as well. When you talk to folks who are instinctive defenders of Darren Wilson and I wrote on Chauncey dot com and I was very direct in my writing. Folks know this about me. I said a lot of those supporters of Darren Wilson are actually participating in a type of homicidal idealization mm. where they actually are happy that a white cop killed a young black person. And there's a deep history going back to lynching and extra uh, judicial violence against black folks. I think there's a significant portion of the public that are instinctively defending Darren Wilson, giving him money, hundreds of thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. on right wing talk radio in their own backstage private lives, winking and nodding and saying, well, we have to give him the benefit of the doubt because they want to support violence against people of color. And when you state it plainly and clearly, you get the, you know, the anger, you get the hostility, but you don't get a cogent response. So in terms of thinking about, you know, and I'm so appreciative of your time and your truth telling and sharing on this matter, what are your future plans in terms of staying involved in the community around this issue in the next, you know, few days, weeks and months? And where can folks find you online if they want to get more information, if they want to read any of your books, if they want to attend your church, if they just want to email and dialogue with you? Well, you can go to my website, RenitaMarie.com. I'm also on Facebook. I'm Renita Marie on Facebook. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Renita Marie, Renita Lampkin. I, I plan to give myself more fully to the issue of, of police brutality, uh, the militarized policing. One of the best books that I've read so far is Rise of the Warrior Cop. Um, excellent book. It is an excellent book. And there's some things that just go back so far and are so deep that it, it's really going to take very full time, very um, a lot of people doing a lot, a lot of in-depth work to make some systemic changes. I believe they can happen, um, but it's not going to be an easy struggle and it's not going to be a quick, quick fix. Um, but I, I'd like to give myself more to working on the issues of militarized policing, policing policies, mass incarceration. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to continue being on the streets when the kids are on the street. I'm not on the street every single night with them anymore. I am out there whenever I feel like it's most dangerous for them to be out there. And I'm out there to stay connected with them and helping to provide for some needs, necessities. They need blankets at Occupy SLU, food, um, cook breakfast for some of them the other day, you know, just staying connected and serving them as best possible. So that, that's, my, that's my present and that's my, my hope for in the future moves. And where's your church again? So folks can my reach out. My church is at 547 Washington in St. Charles, Missouri. The zip code there is 63301. You can GPS us. What is it called? St. John African Methodist Episcopal Church. Just a one-room sanctuary on a side street in the middle of a community. Nice little cozy church community that does very powerful community ministry. And I just want to thank you. I mean, you've done such great sharing, and we're so honest. And as I said, we finally figured out sitting down and chatting, and it was more than worth it. But I'm definitely going to stay in touch. Because I definitely want the folks in the podcast series here on We Are Respectable Negroes and ChaunceyDeVega.com to, number one, hear more from you. And as the events in Ferguson develop, because my concern, again, and this is why it was so important to have you on, is that if you're just a slave, quite literally, to the 24-7 news cycle, you think this story is over. 
And this story is just beginning. And there are many, 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 many Fergusons all across this country. So as matters develop, I'm certainly going to be reaching out to you again. And I hope we can chat some more. Absolutely. I would love to. And thank you for reaching out this time. Thank you, Pastor Renita. And it was a great pleasure. And again, thank you on behalf of the listeners and fans and followers of the website, ChaunceyDeVega.com, and the podcast series here on We Respectable Negroes. You're doing some really great work, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and I send nothing but positive energy towards you. Thank you very much. Blessings to you, too. Right. Thank you very much. I want to thank Pastor Renita Lampley one more time for that great sharing and teaching. That was just a wonderful conversation, and I've been thinking about the visual of young folk and others who are organizing, who are rallying, and the sort of courage it must take to stand up to that sort of state power, and as Mr. Renita, as Pastor Renita said, the idea that they're not afraid to die. And that's very, very powerful when you think about this continuum of resistance, both within this country across the decades and centuries and also around the world with young people who are leading movements, with young people who are the tip of the spear. And now the challenge becomes how do they reorient the politics of older generations? Because that's the struggle, right? The old guard never wants to give anything up. It's not about race. That's about power. So how then do we work in this moment? Because Ferguson is not new. There are many, many Fergusons across America. And there are many, many Fergusons around the world. We've got to think about this as a human rights issue. Very, very important. So Pastor Renita's her image there, I mean, I'm just so touched by it, of these young folks saying, we are ready to act, we are ready to move, and we are going to act peacefully. We are going to act within our citizenship rights. But we are going to act forcefully, and we will not be intimidated. That's inspiring. And it's also inspiring to see folks like Pastor Anita, sister across the color line, as Brother Cornell West would say from the vanilla part of town, right, even though she pastors in a chocolate church. That's my Cornell West impression. So by the time this podcast, episode three, John City Vegas show is released, we will likely have a little more focus on what has happened at Ferguson with the inevitable no bill of Darren Wilson. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope that a collection of people with good conscience can evaluate a glut of evidence that was presented to them in such a way by a biased prosecutor and see through it and do the right thing. And not do the right thing for fear of what would happen in their personal lives or in Ferguson if they do not do the right thing, but that they do the right thing because it's right and because the facts demand to be heard in an open light and that the public The American people deserve to hear the facts in the open light. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's very doubtful, bordering on the impossible. But, hey, you can bet anything you want in Vegas on just about any contest, any outcome. So perhaps some folks are putting some money down in Vegas right now, and they're betting that Darren Wilson's paid vacation, which has enriched him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I wrote about this. I joked about it on Twitter, but it was dark humor. mentioned it on ChaunceyDeVega.com. Think about the value of black life. There's a paradox here. So Darren Wilson shoots dead an unarmed person in the street who was surrendering to him who should not have been stopped in the first place. Basically, he committed the crime of bumptious walking. Darren Wilson, contrary to the versions of events that he spun, the lies are piled on top of lies that somehow Darren Wilson knew that Michael Brown, quote unquote, stole some uh, cigarettes from a convenience store when Darren Wilson clearly did not know this and the evidence, and he didn't put it in a blank police report, which itself actually has been explained to me as a violation of police procedure and grounds for dismissing this man if they really wanted to. But of course they do not. And the chief of police in Ferguson basically said the man would get his job back. So Darren Wilson has received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from people who are living out a fantasy of homicidal ideation where they literally do dream and live through this fantasy of killing black people. And they wear the T-shirt that says, I am Darren Wilson. Think how perverse that is. But back to the irony. So black life is cheap in America. But as it has been historically, killing black people is remarkably enriching financially for the white people to do it. Ain't that something? Furthermore, thinking again about Dred Scott. Buried right down the street, several miles from where Michael Brown was killed. Supreme Court famously said, 19th century, Dred Scott is a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. 2014, and a black man is president. Jim and Jane Crow 2.0, prison industrial complex, militarized, thuggish police who are in a debt peonage racket with America. Folks need to follow that story, about how police are incentivized to stop people, steal from them. And then you have the onus, I have the onus, we have the onus of proving, even if we're innocent, that we should get our property back. Sounds like something from... Mao's China or 
Kafka writing about Russia or the Eastern Bloc, but this is right here in the United States of America, the Carcerell Society, to borrow from the legendary Michel Foucault. Follow-up episode, episode four, season three, the Chauncey de Vegas show. We're, we're continuing, trying to have practical deliverables and teachable moments in the context of discussing the color line and race and police brutality in Ferguson, because many books will be written about this. And many conversations will have been had, not because it's surprising, but because how naked and gross and obvious race and the color line are in terms of how police treat people of color. And then even more, how so many in white America and others are so drunk on the white racial frame and a certain type of blinding myopia that even when the video is in front of them, even when the body is in the street, even when you have multiple witnesses saying something has gone horribly wrong here, you still have too many of our white folk, our white brothers and sisters, who because they imagine they're protected by the police and they hold deep, implicit prejudice and bias towards black people and brown people and black men in particular, that somehow they will reason backwards to justify the murder of unarmed black people. We call this racial paranoiac thinking, to quote Judith Butler. So next episode, Nick Childs, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, has written a great book, came out in October 2014, called Justice While Black. This is an essential book. If you have young man, young woman, child, teenager, if you mentor young people of color about how to survive, especially if they're young and black and they're male, encounters with the police and the prison industrial complex, what do you do when a cop stops you at the traffic stop? How do you make sure you don't get a bad plea or why wouldn't you take the plea deal at the courts? How can small events spin out of control? So Nick offers up some smart, intelligent legal analysis and narrative with his co-author, attorney Robin Schiff, who's based out of Atlanta, about thinking about the Trayvon Martins, thinking about the Michael Browns, thinking about the Eric Gardners. We can go down the list of young black people in this necropolis of death. One African-American killed every 28 hours in America by a cop or one of their self-identified allies. And many of those murders under very suspicious circumstances. So that's the next conversation. So Nick shares some history about the origins of modern policing with the KKK, practical advice about how to survive the police, how to survive encounters with them, real deliverables. Again, that's what we do here on the Chauncey Vegas show about how to talk to those young people in your life. And I would dare say this book is invaluable across the color line. But unfortunately, a lot of our white brothers and sisters aren't there yet. They think this is just a problem for those people. Police abuse and violation of civil rights. That is a problem for all Americans. This is one of the preeminent civil liberty issues of our time. And unfortunately, NIMBA, not in my backyard, colors how too many folk in white America look at this problem. And lo and behold, as we have seen before, when the problem comes to them, when the problem is their kid, when the problem is in their community, they will hold their hands up and act like they are in surprise. A lot of our white brothers and sisters are finally waking up, and they got to bring along, pick up and drag if need be, their family members, their kin, their co-workers, and other members of the white community along with them. you got to open the eyes of those who are willfully blind on this issue. So episode four, Chauncey Vegas Show, will be out next week with, again, Justice While Black, talking about that great book by Nick Childs, and co-authored with attorney Robin Shipp. And as I say at the end of every conversation here, official podcast for ChaunceyDeVega.com, the Chauncey de Vegas Show, the eponymously named Chauncey de Vegas Show. You can find us at ChaunceyDeVega.com. You can find us on YouTube. You just go to YouTube and type in Chauncey de Vega. And we just started the channel a few weeks ago. And please follow us. Subscribe to it. we got to get the numbers up. And everything begins with one small step. So who knows where we will be in six months. I think some good things are going to happen there. So you go to Chauncey de Vega channel on YouTube. You'll see the videos we discuss. You'll see links to the podcast because a lot of folks prefer to watch podcasts as opposed to listening to them. And again... We don't advertise on the Chauncey Vega show. I've had offers. I've said no. I don't advertise on ChaunceyVega.com. I do a twice a year fundraiser, and I so appreciate the generosity of the friends and fans of the website. But if you like what we're doing here, it takes time. It takes energy, what we call opportunity costs, which is the fancy way of the other stuff you could be doing while you're doing this. But I love it, and I learned so much about it. And I'm so gracious for the folks who have agreed to appear on the podcast, for the folks who read and share the articles and essays and questions and sharing and teaching that we try to do on ChaunceyVega.com. We are Respectable Negroes, as the website is actually called. But if you can, if you got the ducats, after you pay the bills, buy the pets their food, treat yourself to a movie or a sandwich, you got a penny or two or a dollar or five or ten, and you want to support us, please do throw that into the donation pile, which can be found in the PayPal link on the right-hand sidebar at ChaunceyVega.com. 
Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for tweeting. And do take care of yourself. And again, the next episode, Justice While Black with Mr. Nick Childs.